But you say this is a, f- a more feminine. Uh, it's a feminine uh, style of antisocial behavior. So cancel culture. There, yeah, yeah. Well, there's two forms of antisocial behavior. There's a male form and a female form. Right. Male antisocial types are they tend to be physically violent. Female violent aggression doesn't work very well. No. Um, first of all, girls tend not to fight physically with one another, and certainly. Girls can't fight. Gr- girls can fight with boys because there's not much difference between girls and boys, say before puberty, in terms of physical strength. But once puberty hits, women can't compete in the physical aggression domain. But women have their own underground means of stealing, and they steal reputation, and they're very good at it. Welcome, YouTubers of the world. I am your host, Frosty Loason, broadcasting from Iceland. With me today is a world-renowned and influential intellectual. He's a former professor at Harvard and the University of Toronto. He's a best-selling author, a public speaker, a podcaster, and an internet personality with an almost cult-like following. He's known for his scientifically blunt and fast-paced conversational style when analyzing many of the most disputed subjects faced by modern homo sapiens. To some, he's a provocative, mad scientist. To others, he's an ideological authority. But to almost all, he's a refreshing gust of intellectual wind. But first and foremost, he's a scholar of the inner workings of the human mind and human behavior. And in fact, he is arguably the most well-known contemporary clinical psychologist. Welcome, Jordan Peterson. Thank you. Thank you very nice much. Nice to see you again. Good to see you too. I have a few questions here. Uh, I'm going to start with this. In junior high, you were active in politics, and fresh out of high school, you entered college to study political science and English literature. Upon graduation, you took a year off to see Europe, as many do, and on your return to Canada, you re-entered uni to study psychology. Why did you decide to pursue a career in psychology over politics? I think because I became dissatisfied as I moved through the political science intellectual landscape away from political philosophy to more contemporary political theory, I never did buy the the doctrine, which is essentially a Marxist doctrine, at least a hidden Marxist doctrine, that the fundamental factor motivating human beings is economic. Mm-hmm. I, I don't believe that. So, and and for the questions that I was interested in, which were really the questions of motivation to commit atrocity in the service of belief, the economic argument fell flat. I thought it was shallow. And and so I understood as I progressed through my political science years, let's say, that I was much more interested in deeper questions of motivation than could be addressed from the from the economic analysis perspective mm-hmm. that perspective would include the notion for example that wars are fought over resources or land and to some degree obviously that's true but it's not true in the fundamental sense that i was interested in and i also became convinced that the problem of totalitarianism was more reasonably construed as a psychological problem than as a sociological, political, or economic problem. And mm-hmm. I believe that to be the case. And so I've had to make a choice throughout my life between the political and the psychological or maybe the theological. And whenever that choice has come up, I've always chosen the focus on the individual and the psychological or theological approach, which mm-hmm. is the more fundamental approach as far as I'm concerned. So would it be fair to say that you were perhaps uh, very much influenced by the psychology of the Second World War and the authoritarianism of the Cold War era? Yeah, well, there was a, there was an insistence, I would say, especially after the Second World War, that the primary moral lesson of the Second World War and the atrocities that accompanied it, particularly in relationship to the Final Solution, was that it was incumbent upon all of us not to forget and repeat Mm -hmm. that. But that was always problematic for me because I didn't understand what don't forget means because I wrote in a paper once called You Can Neither Forget Nor Remember What You Do Not Understand. It's basically the, the title. We don't know 
the pathway to Auschwitz. Right. And you cannot stop yourself from walking down that pathway if you don't know when you're on it. Mm -hmm. And so I would say my whole life, in some real sense, has been devoted to delineating the nature of that pathway and also the alternative to it. Uh, I think when you know the path to hell, then you can start to feel out its counterpart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's if that's not what I'm doing, then that's what I'm trying to do. So the Western societies, are we uh, aware enough of that pathway to hell? No, no. not even close. No. No. Um, Why not? Well, life is complicated and our lives are short and it's difficult to accrue enough wisdom in the short time we have to do it. And mm -hmm. so we're easily led astray by, by foolishness and lies and our proclivity to deceive ourselves and willful blindness and a narrow kind of selfish hedonism and the whole landscape of sin, I suppose, is the classical way of describing it. And that's a tricky business, mm -hmm. to say the least. And it's also the case that avoiding that in many ways was a matter of ritual and custom for a very long period of time. It's difficult to make all of this conscious and explicit. And a huge part of the clinical enterprise, I would say, on the research front and on the practical front has been the attempt to make the pathway to mental and physical health conscious. Uh, the deeper thinkers in that domain, people like Freud and Jung, for example, existential psychologists as well, have done a good job of delineating a fair bit of that, but mm. I wouldn't call it exactly public knowledge, and it's quite complex and, and certainly not all made explicit yet. See, we're, so, we're too sophisticated intellectually to be unconsciously religious. And we have to be consciously religious now, and that's very difficult. Elaborate a little bit. Oh, consciously religious, what do you mean? Well, people put up Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm. Do you know? To, to celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. Right, but, well, <laughs> but what's the relationship between those two? Oh. And why at that time of year? And the answer is, well, we don't know. And that, that's right. So you're unconsciously religious. Yeah. You don't know. Mm -hmm. And so, and that means that when your religious presumptions are challenged, you can't defend them. Mm -hmm. And then under the weight of that challenge, ideological generally, but sometimes scientific, they crumble. Mm -hmm. And then when they crumble, we're lost. And so... Have you become more religious in the past year? I don't know if I've become more religious. I... I would say that the fundamental drive that has oriented me probably since I was, I don't know how long, how old, very young, certainly before I was 13, is a religious drive. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have conceptualized it that way to begin with. I've always been obsessed, as far back as I can remember, with the problem of evil, and that's a religious problem preoccupation. Yeah. If you're in the landscape of good and evil, you're in the religious domain. Mm. And I was very, what would you say, resistant to the blandishments of organized religion. I left the Protestant church in Canada when I was 13. Uh, I couldn't tolerate the conflict between what I knew scientifically and what was hypothetically being offered to me mm. on the religious front. And that hardly made me unique. I mean, that happened to millions of people uh, in, in that era. Too. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 the common, it's the common cultural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, a shallow religion set aside a set against a deep and penetrating scientific worldview. Uh, the shallow religious presumptions have no chance in that debate. But I learned as I progressed, especially once I started to read people like Jung in particular, that. There was way more to be said on the explicitly religious front than I could have possibly dreamed of. And certainly mm -hmm. that exploration, I've certainly not exhausted that exploration. My next book, which I hope to have done by the end of April next year, I'm going to go to a monastery in uh, oh, Vienna. Really? Yeah, just outside of Vienna for three weeks and finish it off in April. Uh -huh. We went to a monastery, um, Cister Cist Cistercian Monastery. Stunningly beautiful place, unbelievably beautiful and old, 800 years old. 
so beautiful and very much reminiscent of Cambridge and Oxford for mm. logical reasons since they were based on monasteries despite the claim that you know religion and learning are hostile to one another I'm going to go there and finish it but it's called We Who Wrestle With God and it's a it's a investigation into well what it means to contend with issues of ethics at the deepest or highest level mm -hmm. interesting so, I'm looking forward to that in 1993, you started working as a college professor, which is a profession that is typically more commonly linked with being a humble academic servant than being a launchpad for international stardom. But now, here we are, the year is 2022, and you are a world-famous academic, which in itself sounds almost paradoxical. How did you become so famous, and how has it affected you as a person? Well... My courses were always extremely popular isn't the right way of, of, of characterizing them. My courses, particularly my Maps of Meaning course, which was predicated on my first book, which took me about 15 years to write, it had a big effect on my students. The most typical response in the student evaluations, well, there were two of them. One was, this course changed the way I looked at everything which is quite a claim. Yeah. And, or this was the most meaningful course I took at university. And another comment often was, I, I'm trying to talk to the people around me about what I'm learning in this course, but I can't generate the language because what I was teaching was so different from everything else that my students were, was encountering, like really qualitatively different. Mm. And so that was the case at Harvard. And uh, then it, it was the case at the University of Toronto. It was even the case at McGill, because when I was a graduate student there, I ran a seminar that a lot of other graduate students attended, which was not standard practice, by the way. And I, I could see already the effect that the ideas that I was disseminating was having on people. And I thought when I published Maps of Meaning, I thought everyone's going to think this way in 50 years. And that's a preposterous thought, right? <laughs> Especially for an academic tome that's very dense and very unlikely to have popular distribution, partly because of its denseness and, well, because it just doesn't happen to academic books. Mm -hmm. But I knew, and it wasn't because these were my ideas. Uh, in many ways, they're not my ideas at all. Perhaps in the most fundamental ways, they're very, very, very old ideas. And But I read enough of the great, of the great works of the great clinicians to have that tremendous advantage and then was able to make a synthesis of that across thinkers that was very compelling to people, one that was focused on issues of meaning, especially meaning in the face of suffering. And that's when meaning, the issue of meaning becomes most crucial. Mm -hmm. And so I could see the effect that it was having on my students. And then one of the consequences of that was a small TV station, TV Ontario, publicly funded TV station, did a series on my classes, which was also basically unheard of, 13 half an hour summaries of uh, a longer 40 hour course. And that attracted a reasonable amount of attention. And at about the same time, I started playing with YouTube and put my lectures online, a lot of them, hundreds of hours of them. And that started to attract a fair bit of attention too. How did you get that idea? Well, put I- Put it on YouTube. Well, I was very interested in YouTube. Mm. Um, when I started playing with it, it was mostly cat videos, but yeah. I could see right away that there was something revolutionary about, not YouTube specifically, about, but about the ability to permanently archive the spoken word. Mm -hmm. That's as big a revolution as the book, except it's even more revolutionary because audio recording in particular might be more revolutionary than the book. Lots of people can listen who can't read. Mm -hmm. Reading is a very, it's a minority occupation. Very few people buy books. A very small percentage of the population buys books. Even a smaller percentage reads the books they buy, mm -hmm. particularly true for difficult nonfiction. And so, and that also tends to skew mail. But listening is a whole different issue because you can listen, everyone can listen virtually and you can listen while you do other things mm -hmm. which is also a huge right. a huge 
technological transformation. So I was very curious about YouTube and I learned long ago that the only way to sate your curiosity about something was to wrestle with it in a hands-on manner, to actually start to use the technology and to play with it. And mm -hmm. so I started to play with YouTube and that was very useful, partly because <laughs> useful and, and not so useful. I, I already had been on YouTube a few years when I made my first foray into political commentary with Bill C-16 in Canada, which was a law mandating compelled speech. Right. And it happened to focus on the issue of trans pronouns, of all the preposterous things. And uh, I had already been experimenting with YouTube and I came down to the table and told my wife and my son that I was going to make some videos commenting on this Bill C-16. And they said, go ahead, you've been talking about these things, but well, just make a video and what can happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I did. I put three videos up, one about the Bill C-16 and, and, and so, uh, two about Bill C-16 and associated issues and one about the university's diversity, mm -hmm. ex, uh, inclusivity and equity policies. And uh, that just caused an mm -hmm. explosion. And the rest is history. Yeah, well, see, part of the, part of the reason that it caused an explosion was that it, it wasn't that easy to take me out because all the material I had put on YouTube at that point meant virtually every single thing I'd ever said to students in my entire academic history was documented and public. Literally hundreds of hours, all the way back to 93 at Harvard. And so when the mob came for me with all the accusations that they brandish, Nazi... Uh, uh, Transphobe. Nazi, particularly, oh. it was utterly preposterous mm -hmm. because, although sticky, um, because I'd actually spent my whole career literally trying to inoculate people against ideologies like the Nazi ideology. So mm -hmm. not only was it not true, it was a specifically specific kind of untruth, mm -hmm. which is anti-truth. So if you're a good liar, you you deviate in a minor way from the truth, right? Right. And that's the easiest way to slide a lie forward. Mm -hmm. But if you're a uh, Luciferian liar, you pronounce the opposite of what is the case. And the idea that I was a Nazi sympathizer, people would go look. They go look at my lectures and they think, well, I don't know what, uh -huh. what he is, but obviously he's not a Nazi sympathizer by any stretch of the imagination in any possible way or an admirer of them equally bloody and devious and demented and appalling communist regimes, which are still waving their blandishments about in the West, aided and abetted by idiot intellectuals of every stripe and the universities at large. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't so easy to take me out as it turned out. Yeah. According to the internet, which of course, as we both know, never lies. Mm. <laughs> You have a net worth of $10 million, which is... Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, okay. It's way more than that. <laughs> was, I was going to say, which, if correct, would make you a significantly wealthy individual. Uh, so I was going to ask, is that true? And if so, has it changed you in any way? Um, it's wealth? a complex management problem. Mm -hmm. You know, pe there's a lot of responsibility that comes along with, with money, and it's a difficult... It's, a, it's difficult to manage. It's easy to squander money. It's easy to misuse it. Um, has it changed me? The wealth? Yeah. Not you, much. You as a person. Not really. Uh -huh. I, I mean, I wasn't economically uncomfortable to begin with. Mm -hmm. I had three jobs and they all paid reasonably well. So I worked as a professor and I had a decent salary as a professor, um, you know, upper middle class salary. And I had a clinical practice and I have a business. And so we were already comfortable, about as comfortable as money can make you. Um, it opens up a whole different realm of opportunity. Mm. And so that's a plus. Um, oh, that's also been, um, and I, I hope in three years to have a lot more money than I do have. I've said right from the beginning, unashamedly, that I'm an evil capitalist. And so it's fine with me that that's happening. Um, I'm not doing this for the money, but I every single business enterprise I operate, and I operate a lot of them, are are for profit, 
because it's it's an impetus to efficiency and care to have to produce products that are marketable. And so I regard it as a sign of moral virtue rather than the opposite. That assumes that you're trading fair and mm -hmm. playing fair. But I am trading fair and playing fair. So I am thrilled about it. And I have a bunch of business uh, uh, ventures well-formed and rolling out, uh, including a writing app called SA.app, which I hope will teach millions of people to write and think. And if it is spectacularly financially successful, then we'll expand it and develop it and so much the better. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. yeah, yeah. And of course, it gives me also a certain degree of autonomy, which I already had that because I had, you know, my clinical practice and my, although that was really taken away from me as essentially was my academic job, but they didn't get my business. Mm -hmm. Ha <laughs> ha. So they, I, I, it wasn't, the, I, I wasn't, I wasn't cancelable mm -hmm. on all fronts, just two out of three. But that wasn't enough. But how did how did they take your clinical practice away from you? Oh well, uh, <sighs> the amount of attention that my my work attracted and the political tension around it became so intense that number one, I didn't have the mental space to concentrate one hundred percent on my clients right. concerns right and that's unforgivable mm. when you're doing therapy in that hour you have to be open and attentive in a way that prioritizes the communication verbal and nonverbal, of the people you're dealing with partly because you're dealing with life and death issues generally yeah. there's no time for distraction mm -hmm. and i was able generally to concentrate without distraction on my clients concerns um but when everything blew up around me, that became impossible. So I, I couldn't see. offer the services properly or be available off hours right. when I needed to be available. And so that isn't exactly taken away, yeah, let's I, say. But, I it, it, but the political conflict made it impossible to consider. Mm -hmm. but, but also, the, the professional colleges have been weaponized. And so it's possible to take a complaint out against me. Anyone in the world can take a complaint out against me for any reason whatsoever, mm -hmm. whether they were my client or not. And then the college launches an investigation, that six month process. They say the process is the punishment and that requires mm -hmm. legal defense on my part. And most of the time I have two or three of those going on at the same time. Right. And so that's also made things practically impossible. I see. And, and the same thing in some real sense happened at the university. There's no way that I thought about, I didn't know what to do with my university career because I wasn't fired. Although all the, all the evidence was pointing to the fact that my firing was the goal. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to stop that in its tracks by being strategic and careful. Um, but, and then I, I became very ill for a variety of reasons, which mm -hmm. I still don't precisely understand. And when I recovered, started to recover in October, I started to think through whether or not, or in August, I guess, I started to think through whether or not I could actually go back to the university because I was on a leave of absence back as a full-time researcher and professor. And I realized that, well, that was just impossible. Not, none of my graduate students are going to get academic jobs. The mere fact that they're associated with me in any way whatsoever will absolutely disqualify them from any academic job for the rest of their lives. Really? Well, look, if you're going up for a professorship, say, at a decent university, mm -hmm. research-oriented university, there's probably 200 applicants for a given entry-level position. And so the issue that is before the hiring committee is who to say no to. And the answer is 99.5% of the applicants. And so any reason to say no yeah. is a reason. And certainly any whiff of scandal, mm -hmm. that, and that's part of that effectiveness of the cancel culture any whiff of scandal is enough to put you in the reject pile even if no matter what the scandal is but also that it's a political scandal and that i'm hypothetically allied with the right in in today's academic climates like that's just a non-starter my mm -hmm. students so how can i have graduate students under that, those conditions and there's no bloody way to get a grant in canada now you have to write a diversity inclusivity and equity statement and i wouldn't write one of those if you put a gun to my head no. so that's a non-starter uh -huh. and well and there's all sorts of other reasons
like many other reasons. Some people say that cancel culture and public shaming uh, are a form of violent bullying, but that has certainly not been fully acknowledged in our societies yet. Yeah, it's and, female and, type antisocial behavior, feminine uh, type antisocial behavior, and it scales on social media. Yeah, okay. yeah, shaming uh, and and uh, and reputation savaging. Yeah, yeah it's and, terrible. I mean, people people tend more to avoid interfering when they witness it. Uh, uh, they, they don't acknowledge it as as a, as a violent behavior. But uh, that, that I was going to ask you if you could describe from a psychological perspective what you think cancel culture actually is and where it stems from. Well, um, th there's a malevolence aspect to it, which is just the delight that people can take in being destructive. And that's part of the whole constellation of, let's say, antisocial behavior. Um, but there's a, a more subtle element to it, which is uh, reputation inflation. So the most valuable thing you possess by any stretch of the imagination is your reputation. Mm. And your reputation basically, I wouldn't call it a status marker exactly. It's a productive generosity and competence marker. And so if you have a good reputation, then people can trust you. And they can trust you to engage in reciprocal productive interactions with them. They can trust you to take their interests into account as well as your own and to play stable, voluntary, desirable, medium to long-term games. And so... Nothing is more valuable than your reputation. And what that means is that people try to game the reputation system. Mm. And that's what narcissists do and Machiavellians and psychopaths. They call that the dark triad. There's a lot of research investigation into dark triad personality cluster. And it's a variant of antisocial behavior. And narcissists have the confidence of the competent without the competence. Mm. And so what they do is overclaim their their contribution. So a nar if you work with a narcissist, everything that goes wrong is your fault and everything that goes right is their doing. Mm -hmm. And they will loudly proclaim that, especially to their superiors and denigrate you like mad if you dare to offer a counter proposition. And narcissists, it's a, it's a, it's a camouflage strategy in some sense the narcissist passes him or herself off as a competent and confident person. And one way of elevating your reputation is to claim unearned moral virtue. And so a huge part of what motivates the woke nonsense that insists that the mere reflexive act of feeling sorry for someone constitutes a moral virtue mm -hmm. is an attempt to claim a reputational status without having to do any of the work whatsoever to be a genuinely good person. To be a good person, you have to be productive. That's hard. Mm. And you have to be generous. And that's hard. And you have to play medium to long-term, stable, voluntary games with other people. And that's hard. That's, that's nothing but diligent, upward-oriented work over years puts you in that position. Whereas if you make a unwarranted moral claim, I'm compassionate, let's say, then instantly you're with the angels. And it also allows you to derogate those who you regard as predatory, let's say, and also enhance your moral virtue. Not only am I compassionate, and that makes me good, but I, and I'm on the side of the angels, but there are the snakes, and they're not in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at all because i'm saintly in all regards and so the snakes have to be somewhere we all suffer from the problem of where to put satan that's for sure and the most convenient place to put him is in someone else and it's even more convenient if that redounds to your benefit and plays to your political uh, aspirations i know a few persons like that and a lot of them are very active on twitter yeah <laughs> yeah well twitter twitter doesn't bring out the best in people likely including me so Would you say this is a, f a more feminine? Uh, it's a feminine uh, style of antisocial behavior. So council culture. There, yeah, yeah. Well, there's two forms of antisocial behavior. There's a male form and a female form, right? Or a masculine form. That's a better way of thinking about it. And a feminine form because men can play the feminine ASP game, antisocial sure. personality, and men can play or females can play the male game. Male antisocial types are 
they tend to be physically violent. Right. And that's evident at the age of two already. So there's a subset of two-year-olds who are already criminals in the making, let's say. They bite, kick, hit, and steal if they're put among other two-year-olds. Most of them are socialized out of it by the age of four, vast majority. But some aren't, and they tend to be outcasts from then on because four-year-olds don't like four-year-old aggressive two-year-olds. They um, won't play with them, and then they get isolated, and then they become and bullies and juvenile into, delinquents, and, right. and it's a bad pathway. It's very stable, too. It's, it's very sad. It's very sad, mm -hmm. actually. And But the male pattern is violent, and we don't like violent criminals, and those are the people who tend to be locked up. Um, and a disproportionate number of people, I think it's 95% in prisons are male, and they're almost all violent. We're much harder on petty violent criminals than we are on like the kinds of white collar criminals who steal the pensions of like 60,000 people. Right. And that's not obvious that that's a wise distinction, mm -hmm. but being mugged is no fun. So you can understand why that's so stringently controlled. Female violent aggression doesn't work very well. No. Um, first of all, girls tend not to fight physically with one another and certainly Girls can't fight, girls can fight with boys because there's not much difference between girls and boys, say, before puberty in terms of physical strength. But once puberty hits, women can't compete in the physical aggression domain. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not inclined to either because they could use guns and knives, but they tend not to. But women have their own underground means of stealing and they steal reputation. And they're very good at it. And it's very many women um, and many other men as well who use this pattern of derogation and reputation enhancement. And, and is, it, is this a, a, scientific, a scientific fact? Yes, absolutely. There's This is a well-developed psychiatric literature stemming back decades. Right. You know, I've talked about this publicly several times. And, and the journalists I talk to are always stunned that this, how could I possibly propose such a thing? It's like, well, there's a... 50-year literature on it. Just because you don't know it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. And so, and it's reputation savaging and, and derogation. Mean girls, you can't play with us. You can't sit with us. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and that's, that's simultaneously a self-elevation and also a derogation of the other. It's very effective and very pernicious and extremely difficult to control. Like, what do you do about it? If you're a girl and you're isolated and shamed in that way, what can you do? You can't really use recourse to authority because if you go tell a teacher, let's say you're being picked on in junior high, then you're just laughed at because you can't handle your own battles and you can't bring it to a physical, um, to the point of physical altercation. You can if you're a man and that happens very rapidly with men, and, and, which is why it almost never happens. It happens almost immediately with men. It's like, what did you say? Mm -hmm. do, you wanna, do you wanna say that again? And any man who earth is salt knows how to play that game. And so generally among men, this just doesn't happen. No. Now on Twitter, online, that's a different story because mm -hmm. that pathway of reputation denigration beckons and social media facilitates its distribution in a, an appalling manner. And it might be the death of all of us that. So the incentive structures on the social media platforms, the social communication platforms are wrong because the antisocial, psychopathic, Machiavellian, narcissistic types who use reputation, derogation, are privileged in their communications and not punished. And that's a very bad idea. Yeah, like Twitter stands out a bit from other social media where, where you, you often um, become more aware of a lot of frustration and anger from the users. It seems to have become some sort of a haven for all this woke social justice uh, thinking that is happening in the minds of so many young people today. Have you considered why Twitter has this appeal? to? Well, I think partly it is because that's the policy of Twitter. Right. Obviously, it's a radically left-leaning organization. That's clear watching the interaction between Twitter and Elon Musk. Right. So some of that's formal policy and Twitter's been captured by the woke types. And so that's a big part of it. But there's more to it than that. Part of the problem with Twitter is the incentive structure. It, it doesn't, uh, a social media communication system should have exactly the same rules as face-to-face -face communication in the real world. Otherwise, it's insane. By definition, if a communication system in a family 
isn't isomorphic with a communication style that would work in the broader world, the family is insane. It's a definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. And Twitter is insane. And part of the reason is, is that imagine you have a house and it's in a gated community. And every house is in a gated community because houses have walls. Mm. And so then imagine that the rule was any stranger, no matter how demented, can come into your house at any time, day or night, if you're talking, and say absolutely anything they want to you, no matter how provocative, and you can't do anything about it. And at the same time, they can broadcast what they're saying to every single person you ever met. Right. Okay, that's Twitter. Yeah, okay, that's insane. Mm -hmm. That's insane. And we, people talk about the democratization of communication. Mm -hmm. That's not the democratization. That's the chaotic flattening of communication hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And to put everyone at every moment on an equal footing is a catastrophic error. We have never had a culture like that in human history for obvious reasons. We've never set up an organization like that ever. And now one of our primary communication channels has that aspect. And part of the problem with that, I think, is that, so imagine that we'll take the, the case of a man who lives in a, in, in a, in his, he lives in his neighborhood. And every time he goes out, there's a neighbor down the street who comes out and harasses him with insults and, and lies. And the first time that happens, you're irritated about it, you know, and, but you don't do anything because you're just irritated, but you're irritated. And then, well, it happens again the next day and the person gets a little closer and then it happens again the next day and the person gets a little closer. What's, what is going to happen to you, man or woman alike, but the man is, I'm using men as a, for a specific example, is that at some point, you're either going to capitulate or you're going to stand up for yourself. Mm -hmm. And part of the way that happens is that each time you're assaulted in that way, insulted in that way, you're going to get a little more annoyed. Mm -hmm. And that's, that accumulates. It doesn't go away. It'll gnaw at you, you know. You'll be inside thinking what the hell's going on here? I've got something to say. I, I can't be yelled at every time I go out on the street. Mm -hmm. And you'll hit a threshold at some point. That's what happens in, in schools. When, when a kid's bullied, yeah. the bullies will stay on him till he either breaks and cries and runs away, in which case he's going to be bullied forever, or he decides, I'm going to hurt you if you keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And then the bullies will almost invariably back off if they're male and, and often if they're female. Um, and sometimes a friendship might even develop at that point, sometimes. Um, and so the problem with Twitter is that there's no response. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happens is that people take the assaulted irritation that is generated on the social media platform and carry it out into the world. So that, and so it's raising the temperature of everything. So you think Twitter is taking us all down to hell or? I mean, what's going to happen? Well, we'll see what happens when Musk buys Twitter. There's uh -huh. ways of remediating this, I would say. And okay. he's careful and perhaps he will remediate it. Um, but it's not just Twitter. Uh, Jonathan Haidt has written quite extensively on the pathologies of Facebook. So Facebook, one of the problems with Facebook is that everyone puts up a very shiny persona on Facebook. Uh, if you look at Facebook... It's like uh, greatest hits of people's lives. Right. And so the problem with that is that young people look at the shiny facade of other people and they compare that with the reality of their own lives, which is often involves a fair bit of suffering and feel that they're somehow lesser. And there's, and we, we don't know how to handle these large scale communication networks. We don't know what implicit rules have to govern them. And we're stumbling forward trying to figure that out. I mean, I don't see that Facebook is a conspiracy to addict. I don't think that's a good way of thinking about it. Mm. Obviously, the social media platforms are going to try to make their offerings sticky. But that's what you do if you're offering a service is you want people to want it. And so thinking about that in consp conspiratorial uh, uh, terms is not helpful. 
I think there are ethical lines that should not be crossed, but also those, those social media platforms have to be assessed for their psychological isomorphism, essentially, with the broader culture. And we just don't know how to do that. It's a technological problem beyond our current levels of comprehension. And that's a big problem. You know, who knew Jonathan Haidt, for example, has concentrated a lot on the consequences of the introduction of the like button. Mm. Well, like, who thought that was serious? Mm -hmm. Well, how about we put a button on our social media platform that lets people say whether they like a comment? It seems harmless, but it's not. It's no. deceptively catastrophic, potentially, because it affects millions of people every day. Right. And so it's very difficult for us to wrap our minds around the fact that this is a massive technological transformation, this like button. And God only knows what it's going to do. That's partly why I tilt in some ways in the conservative direction, right? It's like the iron law of unintended consequences always applies in psychological, psychologically relevant situations. Uh -huh. There's no such thing as a tiny intervention on a social media platform. Right. Um, I somehow get the feeling that people often forget that you are a clinical psychologist. For instance, there was a very heated discussion in the Icelandic Twitter community uh, recently about what you said in a notorious Vice interview about the role of makeup in the workplace. I understood it as a psychological observation where you are saying that human beings, uh, and not necessarily females only, but homo sapiens, use makeup to become more attractive. Well, uh, obviously. Uh, obviously. Uh, in the workplace or anywhere else for that Yeah, matter. they look to, but, to look younger yeah. fundamentally and with less and li with more perfect skin which is also a marker of youth and fertility. Yeah, but this was interpreted as some sort of slut shaming and misogyny on on your behalf. Do you feel that people are willingly to, trying to misrepresent oh, you? Oh, well, there's and, no there's no doubt about that. It's a very small percentage of people. Why is that? Why are they trying to misrepresent? Well, we talked you? about this to some degree already. It's yeah. it's the Cancel notoriety you. that's attendant upon taking a cheap shot at me and claiming the moral virtue that that goes along with that. Right. I was trying to have a well, the guy that was interviewing me, he was he was a he was a narcissistic uh what, what how would I describe him? He was an arrogant, Luciferian, narcissistic little rat. There we go. How's that? <laughs> that's, that's Blunt enough. Good. Yes, and he, he was very full of himself. He certainly was. Yeah. And, and, and he had this air of arrogant skepticism that's cultivated among university students in idiot universities. And when mm. I dared to lay forth a biologically relevant proposition that women, particularly, use makeup to look younger and more fertile, mm. he thought that was absolutely preposterous. Of course, he has. Well, why do people, why do women wear makeup then? Oh, to feel better. So that's your theory, is it? Your stupid theory. Mm -hmm. You're setting that up against 20 years of biological investigation that women use saw, makeup to feel better. I saw that on Twitter. People are saying like, I, I only put makeup on for myself and no one else. Yeah, right. This is ridiculous. Yeah, for myself. Yeah. Right, on my face. Yeah. Where everyone else looks. Mm -hmm. Right. It's well, yeah. Crazy. So there's, well, so part of it is just an... Well, it's part of it is this unconsciousness that we were talking about earlier. Right, right. It's like, do you know why you do things? Well, not exactly. Not exactly. I mean, back in the 80s, there were there were uh, there was a fashion trend for women to have padded shoulders. And that's when women were moving en masse into the workplace. Mm -hmm. Well, why padded shoulders? Well, why do you think? Because it makes you look more physically intimidated. It makes you look more like a man. So why was that a fashion choice? Well, see if you can figure it out with those hints. And they, they, we have this, and then the other sorts of criticisms I'll get about the makeup comments, for example, um, are, well, you're, it's a biological essentialism and that there's no real core to what people regard as beautiful. And the use of makeup is just an arbitrary cultural construction, just like our construction of beauty. It's like, yeah, no, Bullshit. you don't know what you're talking about at all. Mm -hmm. So you can go home with that theory. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it's misogynist, we're trying to have a serious uh, uh, conversation about what kind of workplace behavior is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Well, so I was trying to have the beginnings of a serious conversation with a dimwit, a, nar a narrow-minded, narcissistic dimwit, and who is absolutely full of himself, and that was probably the wrong place to broach the topic, but whatever. Right. C'est la vie. It's been about, what, six years, five years now since you rose to prominence and started getting your message out from the classroom and out to the world. Um, do you feel like anything has changed since then? By that I mean things that you have spoken against, like 
the corruption of the humanity studies, the rise of political correctness, and other things you've been criticizing from the beginning. Yeah, that's all got way worse. Yeah, it's got, oh, it's got it's worse. Way, way, yeah. worse, way worse, way worse. So, it's so, so bad. So where, where do we think? Where do you think we're heading with that? Is are we are we just gonna get worse and worse and worse, or is this ever gonna? We'll see. I mean, part what do you think? of. Well, it's 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 a knife's edge. It could go either way. Things could go really well. Um, I just interviewed a man, Marion Tupi, humanprogress.org, and he's just written a book called Superabundance, laying out quite clearly that we could have the 10 billion or so people that we're, we're slated to produce on a planet where everyone had more than enough of everything, including basic resources, all the basic resources necessary for a secure life and endless education, educational opportunity, a real era of prosperity and wealth, or we can have an absolute hell that would make what happened in World War II and the gulags look like nothing. And everyone is making that decision right now. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that the more people who choose the route to the promised land rather than hell, the more likely we are to move in that direction. And so that's part of what I would regard as, what would you say, my intent is to entice and convince as many people as possible that hell is the wrong destination point. Is, do you think this is worse than, let's say, the Macar McCarthy era? Faster. And this is faster. It's faster. And it's more global. Right? It's faster and more global. Yeah. yeah, it's faster because of the technological transformation, and it's and, and more global for the same reason. So, so, so this, this has always been happening, but it's really sped up. So it's harder to unwind it. We have less time. Mm -hmm. According to the World Health Organization's 2022 World Mental Health Report, nearly 1 billion people suffer from mental illnesses. And in the first year of COVID-19, rates of depression and anxiety increased by more than 25% globally. Now adding war- That was part of, partly a consequence of a campaign to increase depression and anxiety, which was very successful. Right. Because the idea was, well, let's scare people into compliance. Mm -hmm. And that worked. And no one thought, well, what'll happen when we scare all these people who are already on the border of depression and anxiety? And the answer was, well, we're not going to think about that. Mm -hmm. But And now adding war in Europe and, and to the equation and global superpowers uh, exchanging nuclear threats on a daily basis, uh, the rise, rising cost of living, uh, the richer getting richer, the poorer getting poorer, and so on and so on. It, it's only rational to expect the severity and magnitude of mental health issues to increase and funding to decrease. But just as a thought experiment, say in a perfect world, if you, Jordan, had unlimited resources and unlimited political powers to change whatever you felt necessary to tackle the issue on a global scale, what changes would you implement to address the issue of rising mental illness? Well, the first thing I would say is the poor, the rich are getting richer, but the poor aren't getting poorer. The poor are definitely getting richer and very fast. But the inequality is also increasing to some degree in some places. So, but overall, the poor are getting richer at an unbelievably rapid rate. And okay, so, so that's a non-issue. It, it's an issue in that there are still lots of poor people and even those who have got richer still don't have a lot, but it's way better proportionally speaking than it was at any time in human history. On the, I'm not that interested in some sense on the policy front. I'm trying to work that out with people that I'm working with politically, both on the right and the left. I'm more interested, as I said, on the issue of the individual. And so what I'm trying to do is to go around and talk to and communicate with as many people as possible. And that is particularly young men for reasons we won't go into, not that that was my plan to begin with, but that's how it's worked out, to tell people that it actually matters whether they get their act together. Like it actually matters in, in a fundamental sense is that we're going to get through this with the least amount of damage possible if enough people get their act together, shoulder their responsibilities and straighten themselves out. And so for me, this is an, an individual by individual endeavor. And that's why I'm a psychologist and not a politician. And so my hope is that, and I, I mean, what I've seen too is that I really like doing these public lectures I've been doing often to crowds of anywhere between three and 7,000 people, let's say. And um, everyone who comes isn't there for political reasons. They're there because they're, they've decided that aiming up is the right choice. And if enough people decide that fast enough, mm -hmm. then maybe we'll aim up and not down. Is, we'll see. Is that achievable? Uh, 
we'll see. That's what that's what we're going to find out in the course of our life. Mm-hmm. It, it one or the other is achievable. Mm-hmm. It, uh, it's, you find that out in your own life. Is that achievable? You, um, when we talked yeah. before this, you said you've taken all sorts of steps to put your life together. Mm-hmm. Is it more together? Definitely. Then there you go. It's yeah. achievable. And yeah. the more people that do that, the better. But on a massive wide scale, will we be able to heal societies as a whole? Never underestimate the importance of individual transformation, man. You're in yeah. the middle of a network and you're connected at minimum right away to with how many people are we going to talk to today? You and me. A million? Mm. Mm. Right, right. We are connected in these webs, right? Each of us is connected with a thousand people, mm-hmm. one to one. And one step out is a million and two steps out is a billion. We're all of us at the center of a network, of, 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 a, of, a, of an expanding network, and the effects of our individual actions matter way more than we think. And so it will matter in the final analysis, just like it mattered in Nazi Germany and the Gulag states that when people lied, the whole place deteriorated into a totalitarian hell because everyone decided lying was okay. Mm-hmm. If people decide that's not okay, then maybe we can avoid that. And it is an individual It's an individual decision on everyone's part. That's why the redemption of the soul is an individual matter. Right. So last question. Say a hundred years from now, how do you foresee your own legacy being depicted? And and how would you like to be remembered? The thing I do that I like the best is probably encourage people. And so an encouraging word in a in a desert of demoralization and discouragement. See, the young men in particular, they're taught that their their masculine striving forward towards productive generosity, in my estimation, most fundamentally, is nothing but a manifestation of the corrupt will to power should be crushed right from the beginning. They're nothing but a manifestation of the patriarchal oppressors on the social front. And if by some miracle they escape that tarring and feathering, then the environmentalists jump on them and tell them they're a cancer on the planet. And so you see this massive, large-scale demoralizing of young men, which is also a catastrophe for young women who tend to want to marry a young man, for example. And so to say a few words to counter all that bloody, horrific, destructive, inane, demonic idiocy, that's that's a good thing to, to be able to manage. Mm-hmm. And do you think you yeah. will be re- remembered for that? We'll see if anyone's remembered in a hundred years. Mm-hmm. Depends on how much everything has been reduced to ash and rubble. Right. Jordan Peterson, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good to see you again.